and we are recording. All right, so Arun, this welcome to the Linsider. This is episode seven. Um, I'm so glad to have you here. And you know, so on the podcast, I discuss entertainment, but from a cross-cultural and interdisciplinary perspective. That's my way of saying it. That's my way of saying, you know, I think Hollywood needs to, and entertainment industry in general, needs to think much more differently about how we do things going forward. And I want to have a voice for perspectives that I don't hear enough about. And so my original thought was just to hit record and just talk with my friends. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. If there's any, as you will learn, as you know from talking to me, I can talk. If nothing else. <laughs> Yes, and the, the nuggets, the nuggets of wisdom throughout and the, or experience. I mean, I think it's like so simple because like, you know, one thing is almost that the experiences that we have, uh, I think they need to be normalized, whether that's personal life or even, um, you know, as folks that are kind of more behind the scenes in the industry, like to talk about those details and also mm -hmm. the breadth of what you do. Um, so this is... I don't know, you know, this is, I think this is very important, or at least I think a lot of people would dig hearing this. Um, to start, um, just so folks can get to know you a little bit, can you just give a brief introduction about yourself? Maybe say a few things? Yeah, yeah, brief maybe. I don't know, but I can say things. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm, Go for my it. Name's, my name's Runson, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, Jason said. And, uh, I am the director of Brain for the editorial group at Skyman Entertainment. So that editorial, in this case, means comics and books. Skyman is home to properties, you know, like The Walking Dead, uh, Invincible, which just launched on Amazon Prime, and a whole host of other really cool comics uh, and properties. But uh, my, my, I have now worked in comics for about 20 years. I'm 39, turning 40 this year. Started as Big a one. reporter. Yeah, started as a reporter for uh, IGN. Our columnist for IGN uh, was the, uh, I think, first staff uh, writer for uh, Comic Book Resources, which is a big uh, comics website. Then uh, joined Marvel uh, after I was pre med in college, so I think I took a wrong turn somewhere. But I ended up as a, a in communications at Marvel and over and led PR there um, through the launch of Marvel Television, and then left in 2015. Went to Sci-Fi as their VP of Publicity. Um, on the West Coast, there was a reorg. Um, you know, I was the last one in, first one out. Say, Lavia, I have no hard feelings with anybody there, truly. And um, then went to Boom Studios, uh, uh, you know, a newer comic book company you might have heard because of their collaboration with Keanu Reeves. It's definitely the big thing in their history. But I worked there for uh, about just over four years. And then in January of uh, 2021, joined uh, joined Skybound, and it's been um, it's been a blast and. I've been lucky enough to know co-founder Robert Kirkman, who created The Walking Dead for, for almost 20 years, based on that career, and he's uh, uh, he's he's great to work with him in this capacity, and it's been a great group of people here. Awesome, that's amazing. And a little bit of a personal context, like where did you grow up, um, and are you from LA originally? No, so I'm from Toronto originally. I was born in the oh, suburbs right. of Toronto, and so. Um, I grew up there and I, I was there, finished high school and, and, in Ontario, I was thinking I was one of the last classes who had a mandatory grade 13. And I'm gonna, and I'll be honest, I think my grade 13 year, the only classes I had were English, weightlifting, maybe a math class, but most of my days were just spares. It was wonderful. I never had homework to take home because all I did was work in like cafeteria. But, uh. I was going to say that, that sounds pretty awesome for just... It, it was actually a really good way to spend grade 13. Um, yeah. You know, there's... Uh, and then I moved to Minnesota, um, went to business school for literally a day and dropped out right before college. I said I never wanted to be in business. And uh, my parents were oddly supportive, um, and especially for Asian-American parents. And uh, then we, uh, I moved, we all moved to, Minnesota, to Utah a few years later. Lived in Utah oh. for a few years. Uh, then uh, got that job at Marvel. Uh, I was studying uh, pre-med, like I said, in, in college at Weber State University. And then uh, I uh, went over to LA, uh, LA, so New York, for about six and a half years, and then moved to LA about eight years ago. So um, LA is now the second longest I've lived in the place, the closest to home other than Toronto. 
but yeah, I've been a, been a bit all over. I, I have a feeling um, I'll end up moving again um, at some point in my life just because that's my nature, but my wife kind of love it here, so I can't complain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I love it here, LA, but you know, I think it's important to see the world, so. Yeah. And traveling. Um, that's cool. I really like your perspective in the whole comic book world. 20 years, that is very deep, and um, you've seen um, quite a bit of a evolution in the business. What would you say is, yeah. you know, that 20 years, it feels like night and day. Um, what yeah. What would, would be the biggest changes that you observed in the industry? Um, I'm not the only person of color in the room anymore. <laughs> for, the most <laughs> part, for the most part, definitely some situations where I am. But right. uh, I'm maybe the most senior, but not the only one. I, honestly, um, I think the difference is when I talked about comics 20 years ago, people looked at me and said, oh, kid stuff. Uh, you're a dork. Now people just look at me and say, oh, I know what that is. You're still a dork. Um, but like, <laughs> it's, uh, people have, like, Slight change. My parents know what Root is and what a rocket raccoon is. Like that that's mm. blows my mind. You know, like these, these esoteric Guardians of the Galaxy characters who I cannot imagine my, you know, 67-year-old parents knowing who those are. They know everybody's parents kind of know who they are. They they know this stuff um, because Marvel especially has become ubiquitous with, uh, and, and synonymous with pop culture. And uh, you know, people understand graphic novels are and comics are taken are seen as a form of art. They're not um, mm. they're not just seen as uh, Biff Bam Pal like Adam West Batman stuff and. I think there's there's two reasons for that. One is manga. Japanese, you know, Japanese comics manga came and had a huge moment in 2001. Um, I was also working part time at a comic store in Minnesota, and I remember when these hit. And you know, our comic co consumers then were, and it's Minnesota, so take this with a grain of salt. Were mostly middle aged white dudes. Right. Um, and uh, then suddenly there were women coming in the store, and, and I'm not saying they're like, oh my god, girls are like comics. I just meant like suddenly there were women. And women of color and like or or in a non-cisgendered men like in the comic store, queer men in the comic store, like coming for comics that weren't about superheroes. They were about they were comics like initial D that are about race. Mm -hmm. If you've ever if you ever seen yep. um, Tokyo Drift, initial D is basically the comic version of it. Um, you know, there were comics like GTO, which is if I explain the premise is not aged well, but was a fun comic at the time. Um, and uh, Love Hina and all this stuff, Dragon Ball. The, the Dragon Ball was a close superheroes, but people were coming in, and this company Tokyo Pop was really leading it, coming in for these books. Uh, and that is what, and while the popularity ebbed and flowed in comic stores, if you look at the book market right now, if you look at the top 10 selling comics, usually two or three of them are My Hero Academia every month. That's, right. that they're selling 10,000 copies of My Hero Academia, volume one, every month anybody under the age of 20, they all know this and they probably love it. And it is by far the most popular superhero narrative in the world. And there, you mix that with the rise of authors like Raina Telgemeier and Dav Pilkey who do books like Dav does a, a dog man, Raina does book like, books like Smile and Guts. And in the younger reader section, suddenly graphic novels, Amulet, uh, Kazu Kibishi, saying a thing wrong, um, they were doing, uh, they're doing these really, popular series like, uh, like Annular or Dogman and that are selling millions of copies. Like Dogman, each printing sells millions upon millions because uh, they're through the Scholastic Book Fair, these huge audiences and parents are saying, oh, these are comics I can give my kids. And they're not mired in superhero continuity or you have to know which mm -hmm. hammer Thor used. And I love that stuff, but that's yep. not accessible to new audience. And uh, that, you know, the Ryan, so there's those two elements plus, and I'm, gonna, uh, I'm a homer for the company I work for, the rise of companies like Image Comics who make mm -hmm. things like The Walking Dead or a, company, a book called Saga, but made these comics that weren't 10 series you had to follow to know what's going on with Wolverine. They were like, you just read The Walking Dead volume one to 32. That's all you need to read. Yeah. There's no, you don't have to worry about anything else. And that was a way that you found a mainstream audience like to read comics. It suddenly became easier to read comics. And so the rise of independent comics, which you could see 
Ninja Turtles in the 80s, but the rise of independent comics as this giant thing um, created a world where, where lots of people read comics. You had more, you had more genres and more options. But I do think you can't undersell how big uh, manga was and, and still continues to be. If you go to any Barnes and Noble in the last year, the manga section will have grown, and the traditional graphic novel section has shrunk as a result because you will just sell so much more Dragon Ball or Micro Academia or any of that stuff. Wow. So I've never heard that um, version of things, but it makes sense. And it actually makes me so happy because um, I, when I was a kid, I would go back to Taiwan really a, a lot um, every other summer or something like that. And I, like, one of my favorite memories is just wandering into, like, the, like, manga shops. And yeah. you would have, like, shelves of these mangas that you could, you basically, you pay money by the hour and just, like, kind of stand there and you read these comics. Yeah. That's what people do as, as a kid. But you would see, like, just volumes and volumes of it. Like, one of the first ones I loved, it, I mean, I think probably a lot of kids do, it's Dragon Ball Z, right? And I just remember, like, that was also one of the, my motivations for learning how to read Chinese. It's like, I, I have to read this. So, like, in a sense, it's just really cool to hear that because that's not um, attributing that to, like, kind of the widening of the audience. I think it makes a lot of sense because they had, uh, ev back then even, like, a whole different wide range of stories, right? It wasn't just superheroes. It was the Dragon Ball, but you had Sailor Moon, and then you had like normal people. Like they almost had dramas too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. World. I, I would say like the probably the moment I'm, I'm proud, and it ties into this, and I'm proud of stuff in my comics career um, from a press point of view. I think that uh, the thing I'm most proud of is actually the people who have worked with me or worked for me who have gone on to great careers. That, that's my greatest sense of pride. But from a like single execution standpoint, um, I uh, executed the announcement campaign for a character everyone knows now, Miles Morales, who is a mm. mixed race Spider-Man. And uh, that is one of, one of, if not the only time, that comics have appeared on the front page of USA Today. Not, not the front page of the life section, which is an achievement in and of itself, but yeah. the front page with reporter Brian Trude over there. We broke that news, and uh, I'll tell you the good part of it first. We could, the amount of press, it was a Sunday on Colbert, the Washington Post doing op-eds on what it means for there to be a mixed race, black, uh, Latinx, Spider-Man. Um, uh, you know, there is, uh, and I apologize if I should have said Hispanic and I'm wrong with Latinx, I apologize, but mixed race Spider-Man. I get confused. And, yeah, I, I want to make sure I'm respectful of my ignorance. Honestly, my ignorance. Exactly. I get better. I have to get better. We all do. So, like, that is... Um, uh, that was huge, and it was like one of those times where I'm, I may not be either of those races, but it was like I couldn't imagine as a kid there ever be somewhere in a Spider-Man costume who looked like me. Right. And I'll be honest, there aren't many people in comics who look like me, but then you have characters like Miss Marvel, um, who is, you know, a brown uh, New Jersey. You have Simu Liu playing Shang-Chi, which did exist before. It's not good. like you have him starring in this movie. And in both those cases, by the way, in the Miss Marvel TV show and in this movie, seeing Asian Canadian kids makes me so happy. Just makes me so happy because like, I love that specificity. You know, well, I couldn't have imagined. Like I when I watch yeah. Kim's Kim's Convenience, will bring me to tears. Not just because I think it's a fantastic <laughs> show, yeah. But because I, I'll look. My wife Michelle is, I mean, you know, you met her. She's from Manila. She moved yeah. to New York when she was ten, so she's Filipino American. And I tell her like, this show. I am so thankful for the kids who grow up knowing this is not only possible, but is a real goal because I, I feel like emotional right now because that wasn't a thing you could do as a kid. Like I, right. I, in my early twenties, I wanted some acting auditions because I wanted to be on daytime soaps and I wanted to be a power ranger in the reverse role. That's all I wanted from acting and um, put me in all my children or something and I've never been happy. And I was, well, to be clear, I was not a great actor. Um, but it was also very clear I went to auditions. My, I was in a certain, I was got auditioned for certain parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, um, you know, Cal Penn was probably the only actor I saw. And it's, you know, it's a fun fact that I think a lot of people recognize that Cal Penn is not his name. His name is Cal Penn. Cal right. Penn Motor. And yep. it's like he had to change it. I, I think of Chloe Bennett, who I worked with, uh, on, on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. when I did PR for that show. Her name's Chloe Lamb. Yep. She, she, she knew she would get more auditions changing your name. Right. And um, 
But when I see Kim's Convenience, it is Asian Canadian kids and they get to be cool and they get to be sexy and they get to be, they get to be a plurality of things that I couldn't be, that right. me and my, all my Asian Canadian friends, we couldn't be. I, you know, um, you grow up and you, I, I was never quite brown enough for, for, for the Indian Canadians I knew and I wasn't white enough for the white Canadians I knew. I lived in some kind of limbo and I had a lot of Chinese American, Chinese Canadian friends and they were amazing. And they never made me feel like an outsider, but I also did realize where like, that I was like the only one who was that brown. In that group. Mm-hmm. Like, I realized, and it was like, we would joke, and, but there were moments you feel a bit alone. Um, and also it's going back to Miles Morales, the downside to all this was, uh, I had to unplug my phone that day because all the PR calls were coming to my work phone and I got so many racist calls. of so like the, oh, mm. you hate white people, or oh, with a name like, they say urine. I don't know what they where they thought oh, we turned to urine. I don't. I can't describe um, logic right. racism, but they'd be like, "Oh, of course you hate white people." I'm like, "Nope, nope, nope, definitely don't." Um, and uh, wouldn't be in com- wouldn't be in America or in comics <laughs> if that was just the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you realize after a while that these are not good faith conversations with permission of the folks at Marvel. I just unplugged my phone. They went to voicemail and. Um, I just hit delete in every voice now before listening to it. It was not, right. there's no, there's no good. There's no good that came from listening to it. Um, that, that would arise a number of times when we had the first uh, gay superhero marriage and, um, mm. you know, uh, and I was able to work with Mary Bird's office at the time, get him involved and work with Glad. And, but I got a lot of calls in there about how I must, why do I hate uh, Christianity? Or don't know how those two connect. But it's um, and it, w- it was tough. But I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Jason. I I sit here now and I don't I don't want any of the kids I deal with, and anyone under thirty, you're a kid listening to this. Sorry, folks. But it's like any of the kids now coming up, they have no idea what it's like to have a, a, a situation where there's not a Spider Man who's mixed race. They mm-hmm. don't know what it means to not have Shang Chi treated like not an Orientalism trope, but treated like a cool, badass character. They don't know what it's like to, you know, like they're, I, I didn't grow up with shows, I'm thinking Canadian shows like Little Mosque on the Prairie or or like, or, or Kim's Convenience or Fresh Off the Boat. Like these shows that, um, uh, that, that just said you can be Asian, Canadian, American, whatever, and you can be its plurality of things. And for me, it's like, uh, it is the, the small moments when they deal with racism and kids' convenience that, that always get to me because that is uh, we never that, that those stories weren't allowed to be told. I was always told to get over them. I'm sure you went through this too. We were just told to get over it, mm-hmm. and like it's not that bad. Or like you got to stop being so emotional. Whatever coded phrase you use. So that's the greatest joy in this career is just seeing like meeting a whole bunch of kids who are so. Um, who are so passionate? I think I think progress is is a is a conflict is is the result of a conflict between the wisdom of age and the absolutism of youth. That's what gets progress because mm. we give them perspective on how far it's progressed. They give us perspective on how far we have to go. Yeah. Because we started somewhere and we're like, look how good it is. They're like, yeah, it should be better. And you're like, and and I love I love how much they push me to like not just be cool with everything to be to always strive for more. And I can push them to be like, hey. Uh, there are good people. Just give them time. Everyone start giving them a little bit of time to get to the place you're going to get to. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very healthy and balanced perspective. Going back to what you said earlier about kind of the downside of things. Actually, I'm curious um, just to kind of uh, just just go there just for one second. Is yeah. I'm curious with that sort of negativity that you had with such a monumentous event, how did you deal with that um, just emo- emotionally. And then one of the reasons why I asked is because the last guest that I had, um, he actually, um, um, we didn't get time to talk about it, but he's a YouTuber and he has like quarter million subscribers. And he did talk about the fact that, you know, one of the things is that there's a lot of trolls online. And so that definitely affects you. Um, how, yeah, how, in that situation or maybe just in generality, like how do you deal with that kind of stuff? <laughs> I will tell you, it's lonely. Uh, 
a rational point of view. It's really lonely. Um, I'm like, I've actually ever said that out loud. Uh, it's lonely. Like, don't get me wrong, my wife is great to talk to. She, I met her because she worked at Marvel as well. Mm-hmm. And so she had a unique understanding of things. And, and she's an amazing woman in a whole bunch of ways, an amazing partner. But also she she gets it. And um, it's it's lonely. I'm lucky to be at a company like Skybound that has a diversity and inclusivity committee. And that um, when I was doing the interview process, one of the reasons I took the job is – the CMO and the VP of DTC are both Asian Americans. Okay. And it was really, it was one of the few companies I've ever gone through in the geek space that ever had Asian Americans in an executive role and more than right. one, especially, but it was like, Oh, this is great. It's so many people. And it, and it's been great to have a perspective. Um, but it's lonely because you often, if there is uh, Asian American or, or BIPOC inclusivity, it is often at junior ranks. So you end up being like the only person in the senior ranks. And I want to be clear, I benefited from male privilege. I benefited from being in that boys' club to certain degree. So I have privilege. I want to acknowledge that. But it also means that like I have to be the um, I have the, I have both the honor and the burden of being the representative for. All- Uh oh. Hey, Arun? You still there? Uh oh. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you died? I, did, I, I honestly, yeah, I died. I, I, I can try to pick up where I was. You were saying about the burden. Yeah, yeah. It is, um, it's both an honor and a burden to, um, uh, to, to, to be a voice for people. Like it's, it's incredibly flattering. People trust you enough to go into battle for them because they're giving you something personal and they're, they're being vulnerable with you. And I want to do right by them. Um, but it is hard when it is hard when you're in the room with a, with well-meaning people who have probably reached the limits of how progressive they're going to be, whether they acknowledge it or not. Um, and 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 at the same time, even if they want to be more, aren't always as willing to to give up the power, like to give up the power for equality. You know, it's really tough. It is, and so then. The conversations I've found in much many times in my career all devolve into the are you asking me to dilute my talent pool to hire more people? Are you mm-hmm. uh, I, and this is a phrase I've heard not so long ago. Are you and then like, you know, um, we can't impose quotas, it has to happen naturally. And I would and I also I'll look at it and say, Well, naturally, here's what's happening. 
You're not <laughs> choosing these people. So if you want to tell me we're all qualified, like let's have that conversation like real people. Let's have that, but like you can't blame the system for the system. <laughs> and like that's and that's a hard conversation because it's hard for people not to feel put up, to not feel attacked, to not feel threatened. Look, it's hard for me as a cisgendered head male to like sometimes hear where I have privilege or blinders. It is, but it's not difficult. Like it's not the work that we have to do is not difficult. You can step back and say, okay, we need to have we need to have programs where we're, we're identifying new talent and we need to have like feeder systems. And I can make an economic argument to you about why it's real, why instead of paying high for, for, for Jordan Peele when he's now worth this much more, why not try to develop your own one essentially have it a better rate and then when he gets paid more you're making money together so having to buy. like i can make the economic arguments to you you're a film exec you know exactly how this works yep. and but that requires an investment in, in and it requires people being willing to realize what they don't see maybe a result of their life experiences so let me give you a very specific example yeah i did i did not enjoy the captain Marvel movie okay not my thing but can i be honest with you who effing cares? It was yeah. not made like if I enjoyed this incidental to the audience, it meant something to me. that movie meant so much to to people around the world, especially women. And I'm not gonna like imagine though if, but I would never say don't greenlight that movie. I would just be like, if I was sitting in a room with a pitch for that, you need to have women in the room. You need to have people in the room who understand this, so it's not just a bunch of dudes sitting around the room who are like, it doesn't speak to me. No, nah, it just doesn't speak to me because we are limited by our experience and what speaks to us. My, my, my wife, you know, we have very similar interests, but like she loves the Marvel movies. I, I for the most part, like I'm not, I'm not a big live action superhero guy. It's just, mm-hmm. just what I am. And, um, and so we can be different and like, but I would never tell her those aren't good. There's not a value in there. And, I think so often what happens is you have people who believe in the illusion of meritocracy and the illusion of objective taste. And they're like, well, no, the best work will rise to the top. The best people will rise to the top, but they never develop a system for those people, whether whether they be as actors or writers or whatever, to rise to the top. And then they don't have people in the room who understand the nuance of the story. It's like, uh, if you hear the story about, about how, uh, originally for Black Panther, the plan was for, Black, for T'Challa to have a British accent. And I think, I'm not sure if it was Ryan Coogler or Chadwick Boseman who pointed out, they've never been conquered by the British. Why would they talk with a British accent? But it's this like um, bias we have. We hear these right. accents and we think they're erudite and like sophisticated. Right, yep. And you need people in the room with lived experience who say, no, I don't, we would not sound like people we have not been conquered by. Yeah. We didn't need go. to go learn from them. We would sound like Africans. And yep. like, that's, I don't know. That's 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 the tough part, man. It's a lonely experience in there, but it's changed people. And I think there are the generation coming up has no patience for those old ways and old structures. And I cannot wait to see them tear it down. Yeah, we should not. And um, I mean, it just goes to sh- it. It just um, all all of this that you just talked about is also proving the first thing you said about um, the manga and how that opens up the world, right? With all this kind of stuff, like for example. Um, Manga opens a world for other demographics to enjoy this form of storytelling. And then what you mentioned with Captain Marvel, that allows a, also a whole different audience to enjoy the Marvel live action films, right? Mm-hmm. So like the whole time you are growing, so there's one thing where you're growing this pie and instead of fighting over like the same pie, you're growing a bigger pie or creating another one. And so it's actually better business for everyone. So if more people only thought of it that way, um, it's actually the reality. That's actually the truth. Yeah. If you tell these other stories, right, you don't have to blame like declining box office on the fact that no one wants to go to theaters. Like maybe they don't want to go to theaters because they've seen that movie before, you know, like, were, or a yeah. version of that, of, of that, of that story, like over and over and over again. Um, I mean, even one of the things that you mentioned about how having something like, you know, your childhood, right. Or what you could see or could not see on screen. Like the fact that you have uh, these shows like Kim's Convenience on air now, like, you know, the funny thing is that um, if you look a little harder, like those stories are actually the stories that we see around us with our friends or in our 
coworkers or all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But for some reason, only a certain fraction of the stories get on air or get made into films or whatever. And the great thing is like now with technology or whatnot, or just people, I think maybe change, change another thing, just like you have to change the times. With that, the fact that these things are coming out, yeah, like you said, like it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bright future, you know, but with this change, you have some people that are resistant to it. And that's why you had, you know, folks, the, the trolley type people. <laughs> uh, well, I would say like, a different name because the troll sounds a little cute. Yeah, it does. It. It's, <laughs> they're, they're those toys with the jewels and the hair. Um, I, I would say, like, you know, I, I think one of the things people underrate about the Fast and Furious movies, which I unabashedly love, I love is, too. Some is I, I, but I, I would say this, I watch Fast and Furious movies and I exist in that world. Like, yeah. I 100% exist in that world. Like, there may not be an Indian American character, but you have. The cool guy is this is a I want to say some Kang is Korean American like yeah. you know, it's Korean American actor who gets to be the cool guy and he's not the martial artist very explicitly they make it clear he's yeah. not the martial artist and you get to have um, characters of varying ethnicities and, and genders and like uh, so I recently have black character you have a multitude and I mm -hmm. think that is um, I, I think people forget how much that can excite us you know I think back to um, was 2013 um, when Empire hit and it was a huge TV show. Remember, it was mm -hmm. the biggest law network launch forever. And it was also fascinating to me that people were surprised because it meant they didn't know how big the ratings and BET were. So for a black audience, they also, it was also interesting to see how much there wasn't seemingly a rush to copy the, like there were no more, suddenly people treated that like an aberration as though it wasn't a mm. sign of like, every time there is a, especially like I'll look at it with black success, whether it be Black Panther or Rampire, everyone acts like it's an aberration. Yeah. Not like let's find more of these stories. Or yeah. even like crazy rich Asians. Mm. Yes, it's it's an aberration. But but God, but if there is one and I say this with love, there's one mediocre Jason Statham movie, we should make a dozen mediocre Jason Statham movies. I love Jason Statham. His new trailer looks like a perfect I was just gonna say I just movie. saw the new guy Richard film. I was like, it's the same thing, but I still love it. Yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> see it. I cannot wait to see it. I'm gonna pay the money to rent it. But yeah, but it's like where is like that's how we'll know when we won is when we get yeah. perfectly mediocre Asian American romance stories and like yeah. that aren't aren't just with Henry Bull, Henry Golding yeah. but like where we get these perfectly mediocre films and no one says anything about them except we move on and we make more of them. That's like the progress of comics, with film, with TV, with music. Um, we need to have that system. And I, it's funny I was thinking about the other day like that. I hear K-pop on the radio. Like mm. just it's a normal thing. You hear Black Pink or BTS, mm. and you're like, "What a world! We're, amazing world we're in!" Again, a generation will that will grow up hearing music in other languages, and that's perfect. And that's amazing to me. You can't go back. Like that's the thing that that you can't go backwards anymore. This is how it is, and I love this generation that this is just regular for. On that, I think we really also have to remind ourselves to always keep the foot on the pedal because mm -hmm. it is easy. So um, one of the books that I got last year was there was this book called uh, The Hollywood Chinese. And the one thing that I realized is actually there's like in the hundred years of Hollywood, there's actually so many moments of um, Chinese excellence, like um, Anime Wong, Nancy Kwan, going, uh, so going back like a long, long time. But what happens is every time there's like a little success, I don't know exactly what happens. I haven't read the whole book yet. Um, because there's amazing pictures, but at some point then it's forgotten. Maybe a little bit like what you said with like the black experience, right? Um, it's treated as like an anomaly. So then you don't put the resources and time into developing like the next one. Can, can I be honest with you, Jason? I think a lot of it is because there are people for who the, the who value the aesthetic of progress more than the substance of progress. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so there's two things I think happen. One, is hey look we made we made crazy rich Asians look we're progressive let's just go back to everything else we, we, we gave you your thing as though we're supposed to be like grateful for the table scraps as though like right. you, as though we didn't already deserve this the other version is when it feels like the rubber band snaps back it's like whoa 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 yeah. Minari look at all this like um I know that's a whole controversy in of itself but I can see someone be like Okay, look, look at all the Asian people, Asian and Asian Americans who've been here. Okay, great. Let's go back to making normal movies now. 
All right. And for them, it's just like we went so far. We don't want to become the Asian movie company, <laughs> do we? Which I want to be like, as you know from your experience, yeah, there's a lot of money in being that. <laughs> you want to be that. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that is uh, uh, that, that's what happens. But it, it is there's a there's a lot of people in every industry who value the aesthetic more than the substance. And um, I actually think those are in some ways, um, in some moments, can be the more dangerous ones because they're the ones we believe are who we believe are falsely at, falsely believe are allies and who falsely themselves believe they're allies. And um, it's tough and you have to give people a chance to learn. You have to help them learn because we have to allow each other our imperfections and our room for growth. Mm. But it's but we have to also hold each other accountable. And um, I've you know you and I have both met amazing allies outside of our our identities in this industry. And I always try to make sure I verbalize to those people how much I don't take it for granted. Right, that, uh, they are such good allies because I think it can help to know you're doing good. Look, it helps. It helped me from some of the people on my team uh, who are queer to know that I was doing something to at least help their community because not that I'm some hero or anything, it's not that, but like I, it was nice to hear that my, I was making, I was actually like doing something because sometimes well, you, you don't know if you're, you're, you're helping. Thoughtful. You care about someone else, right? And their situation, yeah. right? Yeah, we have to recognize, we have to recognize, we recognize each other when they care. So um, it's tough, but look, I, I do believe we're in a good place. I do believe we're getting, I do believe it's getting better. I do believe mm -hmm. we're making progress. But, uh, you know, um, over those last 20 years, I can tell you it's still not enough. Yeah. Definitely not enough. Totally. Yeah. Needs to yeah. be more. Um, and as a Canadian, um, do you think that that, um, like, do you, do you find yourself thinking about that working in the U.S. a lot? And how does that help you? Or is that, a, is that ever a detriment? Oh, you mean the Canadian identity or having grown yeah. up in Canada? Yeah. It's interesting. I'll tell you the perspective I have is that when I was growing up in Canada, uh, I used to not get invited to some birthday parties because I wasn't Christian. And like my, their parents would tell my parents I'd be a bad influence, but that I was, I was allowed to give a gift, but you couldn't come to the party. You're like, okay. And um, I remember always being really Canadian and I was born there. My parents are great, mm. but I was born there. You know, and um, it took me a long time. There's a group of friends I have who are who are, who are a comic studio in Canada called in Toronto called Raid R A I D, um, with Asian American and Asian Canadian, sorry, multiracial group. Um, Francis Manipal, Kalman Andrusovsky, uh, Marcus Toe, uh, Ramon Perez, a great group of people there, um, who really over the last like five six years have helped me. Uh, let go of a lot of the anger I had about when I grew up in Toronto and feeling like mm. all I, I, I also always get angry and wonder why am I not enough? Like, don't get me wrong. Mm. I was a dork. I had my own issues, but like, why was I not enough? Why was I, why was I never Canadian enough? Why did mm. I, why did I have to justify my Canadian? Why did it, and that's something that's my fault, right? Like I was uncomfortable with my own skin, but like, why wasn't I enough? And they were a really good group of friends who helped me understand that I was. Um, and I had other good friends, but like, it was really, I think in 2016, I was there, I went back to Toronto to watch some uh, World Series playoff games. And I spent mm -hmm. with these guys, and it was, yep. it was really the first time I felt like um, I reclaimed my Canadian identity in a way that was, that was about the positive and not just the, um, I didn't feel desperate to fit in. I felt like I finally fit in. And I had, I had, I had some good white friends as well that made me feel that way, but it was, Right. It was tough because even these kids when they were younger and I tried not to hold it against them would be like, you know, you're Canadian, but you're not a Canadian Canadian. You're right. And then coming to the US, you know, the great melting pot, the if you work so hard, the, 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 the American exceptionalism. I moved here in 2000 and then 9-11 hit and I was very right. much the wrong skin color in this country for a different reason. And mm -hmm. dating was really hard. Um, it was, I could tell where people were uh, perceive me differently. You all got the, oh, where are you from? And you know this, Jason, where are you, where are you from is a three-part question. Where are you from? <laughs> oh, where are you really from? And then, oh, where are your parents from? It's always right. three parts. Yeah. And um, 
Uh, I get, um, I get to this day, I get your English is excellent. Yeah, man, I gotta be honest with you, <laughs> dude. That's a, that is, um, I get the, I get that, I get the more and people ask me if I'm Muslim, but I tell them I'm not a you know, really offensive side for relief. And I've actually learned to not answer that question anymore. I'm Hindu and I'm Sikh, but I'm like, people, are you Muslim? I'm like, it doesn't matter. It's just my response. It just doesn't. Mm. Like I, in answering it, I provided them a bit of validation because I myself was trying to like, you know, find acceptance because not that I, right. I'm not to, this, so you can like me. <laughs> yes, yes, and I realized I was playing to a trap. And um, it's like when people tell me I have an exotic name, and I and I have told a, uh, I told a Lyft driver to f off one day. He said that to me. We just pulled us up at home, and he's like, he's like, well, I said no, you can like, you can honestly f off. And I said the whole word. I said like. Doesn't matter. Like we can drive where I'm going, bro. I'll pay you. You'll get. It. But like, please don't talk to me. Like, just right. you would not ask a person named Matt their exotic name. Really more exotic than some guy named Matt. He's right. like, well, I didn't mean offense. And I'm like, I, I said, like, dude, we're not talking. Like, we're just not right. talking. Right. That's and so we phone and it was, um, uh, you know, I didn't put the guy on blast or report him to Lyft. I, right. I didn't need to do that, but like I was. So you know what this is? I, I don't have time for that. Um, and so, uh, you know, living in Utah, honestly, Utah was a place where I found more friends who gave less of a crap about my racial identity than mm. any other anywhere I've lived. Honestly, it was a bunch of really good blue collar 20 somethings. And I was a middle class 20 something. And uh, though that's the place where my white friend would come over and eat the Indian food, could say my parents' names correctly, would actually talk to my parents like human beings right. um, and would actually defend me mm. and tr and would never make me apologize. Like I had a friend before I was like, uh, sometimes so I'd go by different names instead of a room. And I had a friend who's like, stop, your name's a room. So mm -hmm. he'd be like, that's an effing cool name, man. My name's, right. you know, like Nick. He's like, I don't have a cool name. It's normal. You have a cool name. And you might be like a room and still other than you. I don't know, man. That felt good to me. Like I was yeah. being other. I felt like I got to be cool. Right. And, and it was like, or just like, the, right? yeah, yeah. And that was like the first time uh, I just wrote an essay about this for a friend's book on Asian American identity. And it was the first time I had three Mormon friends, white guys who would like, who would literally get in front of punches for me. If we go to the club and stuff happens, they, right. they'd have my back when I, you know, we all act a fool. And like, they would, um, and, and so it was, it gave what to your question, it gave, it, it, I'm trying to answer it. It's a game of perspective. Like New York was, New York is 100% the most outwardly racist place I ever lived. 100%. Mm. It, um, I got stopped, randomly stopped for stop and frisk so often, Jason. And I was like, all I could do was just grin and bear it because you fight, you don't, right. you don't, oh, you don't yeah. win. You don't win yeah, the look no. of that. You don't win no. the look of it. Um, no. It becomes and like a power thing. It is actually a power. And it, to this day, I consider um, TSA pre-check. Uh, I consider that like extortion. I do it because I don't want, I am tired of, this happens so much more. Yeah. I am sick and tired of my pants being taken, pulled down in front right. of everybody. I'm not taken to the side. My right. pants are open and pulled down and people put their hands down. Do you have a weapon down there? And my response to them glibly is, it's not that big. And like, because I have to, because, um, and, and like, because honestly, I, I'm like, what, what do you, like, what is this? Like, right. and I, this happened most recently to me in 2019 in January at uh, Seattle airport. And I'm trying, and I got out and they're like, well, they're, they're like, well, you have some metal, you have a weapon. And I said, um, I don't, I have some metal and I have had a bunch of surgery. So I have, Metal in my jaw, metal in my chest, metal in my shoulder, metal in my bicep, metal wire going through here. And um, uh, and I said, look, there's 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 that. But they're like, well, and they just put their hand down my pants. I'm like, I'm sorry, do you find anything you like there? And they're like, sir, you need to calm down. And I said, you need to do that. And one of my friends, his name is Spencer Simpson. He worked for me at Boone Studios. Phenomenal human being. And who would have thought a white guy from Alabama would be like one of my best allies I've ever met in the industry. But Spencer Simpson's a great guy. He just walked over. He's like, is there anything wrong here? And the minute they saw him walk over, they were like, oh, no, we're good. Because I had a white ally. Yeah. And 
Uh, as Boom is aware, I expensed three shots of uh, tequila for my dinner that night because I was just not a good mood. Right. Um, and you know, and like that's uh, it's giving me perspective. And and look, LA is no um, is no cakewalk, but uh, you know, it was uh, one day. Michelle and I, and my wife, did we move to Toronto one day? Maybe I'm still a Canadian, mm-hmm. an American citizen, and Canadian. Maybe we do. Maybe we move to Vancouver. Right. We love Montreal, but we also realize there's only a certain part of Montreal and Quebec that's really integrated. And um, there's uh, other things you have to think about. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's the thing, man. Like we talk about moving, and we've actually, based on social political concerns, we have a very narrow list of states we really think makes sense for oh, yeah. us to move to. Mm-hmm. And you know, because we moved to Florida, I'm going to be Cuban. I think that's what I get mistaken for. Um, not moving to Texas, uh, right. you know, and there's a very list, smallest of states where, you know, um, you know, this man, we've paid, we've paid our dues eating that crap and we, I don't need to put myself on that front line of it every day. Um, at this point in my life, I'm, I'm going to fight, but I want to live somewhere where I can step out my door and my wife feels safe. Right. That's what I want. For sure. Um, on that, uh, I was recently thinking of Hawaii. <laughs> you know what? I love that. I've actually never been. She's visited. I've never been. Oh, you've never but been. Everybody tells me the minute I go there, I won't want to leave. Yeah, um, you should just you should just go just to see it. You know. And so my my see. goal is that's what I take my life plan here, Jason. You're you're a you know for all your listeners knows you're a very connected, powerful, influential man in this world. I need you to introduce me to the Rock, so we become best friends. <laughs> we become workout buddies. I know. I become, I I become like. Influence. <laughs> I become his farm hand or whatever on where his home is. I'm yeah. look, man. I'll be the. I'll take care. I'll be the housekeeper. And then I live in Hawaii, taking care of the rock stuff. I get to work out with him every so often. That's right. my plan. Jason, you are a connected man. With <laughs> you and everyone else. We all. We all. We all want that job. <laughs> yeah. Jason, I'll hire. Look, we'll figure it out together, man. We'll right. Figure it out together. Yeah. You can produce enough, the biopic. We'll, we'll grow the pie. We'll grow the pie yeah. there. Yeah. Um. I had a question for you on, you know, working in not just entertainment, but in a role that you have is more media and marketing communications. These things that you're talking about, both in real life and in the industry, um, what role do you think the media has in this and how can things, how can the media do better? Oh boy. Oh boy. You, you, you went for the softball question there, didn't you? <laughs> I think there is an incredible responsibility for the media to um, not present mistruths about, uh, about racism as uh, another side. Um, you know, you'll see often people quoted like Senator Mitch McConnell says there, there is, there is no racism in the use of the filibuster. Well, it's just not true, you know, like, or whatever the quote was like, You've presented a, it's a falsehood, and so if you don't want to say he lied, you can say incorrectly. Like I, I'm not here to adjudicate lie versus mistake versus whatever. But I also think the other part of it is we have to discuss the stories of Asian Americans, not just when they're um, victims of violence, and and often then the story is about the perpetrator, mm-hmm. but also in our moments of excellence, yep. and not at, and normalize our excellence so that when we talk about it, I'm sorry, when you see a story of someone who's white who's successful, you're not like, oh my God, a white man succeeded, right? Yep. And, and, and you, I want to have a story about Jason Lin and his venture. And it's not like, look at a new Asian American voice hitting it, how groundbreaking it is. Right. Like, I'm tired of the first. I'm tired of the second. I just want us to talk about, look at, look at what Jason Lin is doing, exploring identity. Isn't that so cool? Fifth right. paragraph, by the way, Asian American entrepreneur. Right. That's what I want. And I want it to get to a place where I'm not surprised when I see that story about Asian American. I want it to be such a normal conversation. And I want, um, I think media has to look at how they frame those conversations. Media has to make a, has to have more diverse voices in the, in the newsrooms to talk, have these conversations. And I look at stuff like the Washington Post, um, controversy right now about their guidelines about who can, who can cover what stories and their their thoughts of oh. what bias are you know their thoughts of what bias are amount to if you have lived an experience you are biased unless you're a white man mm-hmm. and again i'm not saying anybody inherently at the washington post means to be racist but you may not mean to be something and the end result can still be that 
And the end right. result is a racist, biased, sexist policy that needs to be fixed. And um, the Washington Post is not alone in that. Um, but that is, we go back to our conversation about having people in the room. I think Ryan Coogler is the one who told the story before about going to, and I may, I may hope I get these names right, going to meet Marvel Studios. And if, if Nate Moore hadn't been in the room, he didn't want to do a Black Panther movie. There was no one Black in the room mm-hmm. who understood what story they were telling. Right. And uh, I think about that, like, you know, this is where like, well, we can't tokenize. I don't look at tokenizing. There are um, tons of deserving Asian American, BIPOC, queer, oh, yeah. non-binary, whatever, uh, a group who should be in those rooms. And it's time we correct our mistakes. Yep. That is not tokenizing. That is doing right. It's, um, I was having a story with someone having this conversation two weeks ago. Um, about about statements made about the stop Asian hate statements yep. that have been made and, and Skybound I want to say give credit to Robert Kirkman and David Albert aka DA at, um, at Skybound very quickly and unequivocally um, and Eric Stevenson over at Image Comics moved uh, very quickly and unequivocally to dis- to make sure they st- repudiated um, those horrible acts and that horrible crime. And, and the rise of violence. And I, you know, I had a conversation with various people around in, in comics saying, for you, words about anti-Asian or stop Asian hate may feel empty because they're just words. And I would say, well, that might mean you have an absence of action. But for Asian Americans like us, we haven't heard people speak up about this. Mm-hmm. You know, we haven't heard people speak for us. So the words are the first step along the way. They are the they are for you, they're the lowest bar for us. They're the bar we're still trying to achieve. And I agree they yeah. should be the lowest, but let's grasp that bar before we look down on it. And I feel like we're now grasping it. And whether they're performative, whether uh, what our job is, you said this, you were so right about this, Jason, is we can't take our foot off the pedal. Great, you said it. Now, what are you doing? Show me the good. The same thing that we all have to do for our black siblings um, who, who, we made statements of solidarity with last year. We have to, we have to uh, interrogate ourselves and companies made these statements up. We have to, we have to hold them to account, mm-hmm. not as punishment, but to help them grow and to help them be better because we, look, if you are Asian Americans the wrong way, we got lots of money to spend in places. We want to spend it with you. So do black Americans, so do Hispanic, and Latino. We, all these groups have lots of money. It is why when a product is made for us, it does so incredibly well. It is yeah. why there are, there are um, uh, if you listen to Latin or Hispanic, uh, Spanish music stations, there are stars you've never heard of. Oh, yeah. More popular than anyone you know. Mm-hmm. But just because you haven't heard of them, you think they're not. BTS did not need America to be rich forever. But it certainly helps. But, mm-hmm. like, that's, that is, you know, there's well, that's all the place that they deserve, right? You know? Yes. Yeah, it's like, obviously, like, I, you, you hear us on, like, Dynamite, you're like, this is cool. But yep. you need to have people like John Cena, who was going out there talking about BTS before for, before mer- very many American influ- actors, influencers knew who BTS were. And you need to actually have more people like John Cena who go and learn other languages and learn other cultures. Yes, for business purposes, but also because they actually commit to the ideal they espouse. Yeah. Um, and uh, it is um, God. You, everyone listening, Rude, you talk a lot. You, you're shiny petty, man. Yeah, no. But like, uh, this is a uh, this this is like this is what they need to do. And um, I am. I think it's really important, Jason. I want to say this. Thank you for for giving people like myself this forum. For people like Pat, friends like Pageant who were around here before. Yeah. Um, for I think creating this forum because I think it is uh, it is also an example of you putting your your, your time and your money where your mouth is. This is this is an endeavor. This is a long term endeavor. This is not like you're like let me do a podcast and get rich. You are you. This is a thing of passion, and it, it is you paying to your ideals. And I I respect the hell out of that man. And it's uh, it's it, it, it inspires me to say what else can I be doing to elevate um, voices. Around? Yeah, that's the beauty of um, where we are right now with technology. Like, you know, like I've had this idea and I didn't know what to do. I was like, oh, how do I do this? Like a podcast. How do I record? How do I get a light? How do I do the video? What, like, how do I do everything? And then, you know, I just, I had, I, at some point I was just like, well, I'll figure it out. And you do this step by step. 
Um, but I came to this like with super low kind of expectations. So we'll see where this goes. Um, yeah. But I think um, the more of us that do it and figure it out in our own way, whatever that is, like, you know, that, no, no one has to copy anyone or it's fine copying if that's what you want to do too. But <laughs> everyone just kind of figure out what it is for themselves and do something, right? Um, I'm curious also like, you know, um, I'll first go to like, um, you mentioned kind of in your role and kind of tackling these uh, biases or things like that. Um, how do you, is there a certain thing that you do in your job to whether train your employees, like people that work for you or train the media to try to, you know, kind of move things forward? Uh, you mean in terms of talking about race or inclusivity or? Or just, you know, yeah. Or even just doing your, 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 your like selling a comic or talking about a comic, but doing it so in a way that helps move the conversation forward. Like, cause you mentioned like, for example, not wanting to see like the first Asian, whatever in the first paragraph, is there, are there things that you, like, what are the things that you're doing? Like yeah. with your employees with the media partners that you're working with, like to, to, like what are actionable steps? I think it's just I think it would be cool I, to hear some of the, the things that you might do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, yeah. I think um, with media, I think uh, when you work with good partners, um, you make their lives easier when you help give them the pitch. Like you don't, you're not writing the story for them, but you, on some level, if you cannot articulate a compelling headline and a compelling like lead, then. Uh, you're never going to be able to sell it. So part of what you have to do is figure out how to have these conversations in a way. Uh, this was a big debate actually at Marvel. We announced Miles Morales. It was a debate in the press release if we say he was mixed race or just let the art show it. Mm -hmm. Because we we were we were having a real conversation about are we commodifying racism? Mm -hmm. So that stuck with me. Um, and uh, we uh, and at what point is saying the thing? A, a version of support. And I want to say that we said North Star, who was next man, he was marrying his boyfriend. I think we said the first girl, wedding. we might have said it, but certainly we made sure to talk about that because that was at a point when I think New York had just legalized um, same sex marriage or uh, gay marriage. And they, uh, and we wanted to, while the company couldn't take a position, we wanted it to be clear the characters in the story were taking a position. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a difficult line to, to, to walk. Then when we talk about things, I always there's two things. One, it's this the pitch, like I said, the lead in the headline. The second part is dealing with your own unconscious bias and making sure that you are finding ways to elevate those creators. Because mm. um, you, you, it's easy to fall into the trap of saying, I'm saying creators because of comics, to be like, oh, the so and so, usually white, usually male, they're the big ones. Look at the headlines. I'll keep pitching them. You got well, you got to put in the work to the uh, making the other creators bigger. So maybe you can't land someone else at New York Times, but you can land them at sites like Nerd Geeks of Color or Nerds of Color or comicbook.com, which is a gigantic site, or, or comic resources. And you can start building up awareness there because you recognize the ecosystem, which is all your geek reporters at the New York Times or Washington Post also read the sites. So you mm -hmm. are elevating them with those writers. And eventually you can then get to a place where you're, um, you're pitching. Like, to me, it's like you should always be in motion. Like, you have this talent, find ways to pitch them. So you have to always be looking at other ways to elevate. And you can't get that white whale. You have to look for other ways to keep them in the conversation because that is ultimately the only way to make them household names who then can get pitched to those bigger places. The second part of it is um, as a person at a, at, a, at a company, I think there's two responsibilities you have. To the people who report to you, uh, it's important to be vulnerable and share your experiences. It is also really important to listen to them and let them share their experiences. And so uh, I was always really big on small things, especially small, like never tell me so-and-so couldn't get you something in time unless they were literally writing and drawing the comic themselves. It's not their, like, it's not their fault. Like if you start speaking about things as, hey, this wasn't available, you create collaboration because you're not creating heroes and villains. Um, you're not pointing fingers. The other part is like, we should, we have to have environments where we're comfortable talking about identity and that we can correct each other or educate each other. Mm. when we don't use proper, we don't use correct pronouns. We don't use correct pronunciations. Like we should, 
be okay with someone asking us, hey, is that the correct way to pronounce that person's name? I've never heard it that way. Right. And someone else may be like, oh, yes, I asked. And if someone says, well, I think so, like, did we ever ask the person? I would ask people all the time, is that how I say your name correctly? And then try to spell it out phonetically. And it's, you know, I, because it, rather than someone calling me Mr. Singh, let me just teach you to say your name. Right. And then, you know, um, we can go from there. But it, it, it can be a lot for people. My, my wife's last name is Mira Segan. And I first thought it was Mara Segan because mm-hmm. it could be, or it could be Mara Segan. Like, and she teaches you Mara Segan. And um, my name's Arun, but if you talk to some Indians, it'll be Arun. Or, mm-hmm. You know, and like, that's valid too. I just don't say my name that way. Right. And um, so you want to, like, you know, like, it's a Kamala versus Kamala. I think it depends yeah. how you say your name. So yes, yeah. um, I think then I think as a as someone who is BIPOC, I have a responsibility to them as a the people who are my peers or my superiors is to educate them, and that's really tough. And that's where the biggest burden comes on us because you can sometimes feel it can feel like I said lonely, like the one in the room. But you have to. I usually I what I would try to do is collect articles that I found interesting, articulated stuff well. Um, and be able to share those when I bring up an issue like, hey, you're, we're, actually just, we're actually getting into like an area with this trope. Like if I want to talk about the white savior trope you know, as it relates especially to the Asian American stories, I'd like to have some articles and I'll just say like, hey, here's the thing you're talking about. Or mm. articles about, I have saved articles about Minari so that when we talk about Asian American stories, you know, even at somewhere like Skybound, we talk about them like American stories. It's not an issue yeah. I have at Skybound, but I've saved those articles to be like, hey, this is, this is how people verbalized, smarter than me, verbalized conversation around Asian American story relative to Minari, we should keep that in mind. But it's, um, I think you, what you have to do in both those situations is you have to, as as a person put the work in yeah. to finding the right, the most solution-oriented words. That doesn't yeah. mean that to be politicked and, 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 mis- and, and massaged to death. But ultimately, there's two versions of the conversation. Hey, uh, Aaron, uh, it's a rune. Are you an effing idiot? You don't know how to pronounce my name? Right. Or, hey, no. Uh, and at the end, if it's plain side, but like, actually, it's like it's no worries, dude. But like, it's a rune, like maroon at the end, and there'll be there'll be a gas. But like, right. you haven't tried to make them look bad in your group. You've had a conversation inside, and as you get to throwing your issues, look, there are people who might hear this and be like, Maroon, I've heard you talk about race." you put me on my heels a bit and sure. And I will say that I probably thought that was the right thing to do. Maybe I was wrong, but uh, there are also, you have to also then learn when you do need to be a little bit intractable and, and, but you need precision in your language. You need precision. So keep educating yourself. I learned a few weeks ago, the term similarity bias, which I didn't know. And similarity bias, unconscious bias. Those are, you might say, aren't those just euphemisms for racism? Mm-hmm. They could be, but they're more effective at singling out what I need to single out in the conversation. Right, specific. Yeah, and and we both know the only thing worse than being racist is being labeled a racist. So, uh, for a certain segment of people, so I can be angry at that reality, but I need to accept that reality and work within it with the people I have. Right, um, and that's like that's the conversation that you have to educate yourself. And what I say is road testing conversations with people you trust. And see how they react, see what they think, and l- and listen when they tell you why it's not connected. Yeah, wow, that's really great. Um, I want to acknowledge you for doing that because, first of all, you said about the work, right? So you have to put it in work. It's a hard work because a lot of times people don't want to do this work. And then the other thing is helping not only educate yourself, but then doing the next step, which is helping figure out, like you mentioned with the article clippings, like helping to educate other people and to share that information. Because a lot of times, like we're all busy, like we don't have that time or we don't want to do it or whatever other reason there is. Um, but yeah. Can I, tell you, can I tell you the method that works for me really well? Yes, please. Um, I, I build, I'll build an FAQ and so in a while, I'll just make a word doc and in bold will be the person I'm talking to in the, the, the non-bold movement. And I make the questions as, I make them as good faith and as bad faith as possible. So like I, I run through like, hey, hey person, here's my issue. Oh, but why is this an issue? And you and, and then you you I, I find them writing on the conversation, I play through it all and be like, and I've learned now over time, I don't have to always write down, I can see where this is gonna get to the 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 decision the conversation will get to the tokenism accusation or the meritocracy thing. 
And I, and, and it's helped me to like try to list, think of all the questions they might ask. And I don't have to agree with them. Mm -hmm. I know those questions exist. I have to have a way to respond and then move the conversation forward and explain sometimes why the premise of the question is flawed. But you know, like, and, and it's, um, you have to learn to do it very quickly. And as people can tell, I'm loquacious. So especially for me, I have to learn to do this efficiently because yep. these people, the people you're talking to only have so much time and they're, they're already emotionally on their heel from the conversation, but writing it down is always, I think anything with emotions, writing it down is the best thing. But once you write it, write it, let it sit and then come back to the document. And just be like, do I sound like an A? Okay. Well, I can't swear. Do I sound like a jerk? Do yeah. I sound like a jerk? And oh, you can swear on here. <laughs> okay. Do I sound like an a, a fucking asshole? And if I yeah. do, how do I at least change the word? If it was in an email, I wouldn't get in trouble for it. Like, I'll think of that. When you write it right. down, you think about your words, and if it wouldn't put it in an email, you're not saved in someone's face. Um, and so, like, this is, it's, it's a constant challenge. And I do want to say one other thing. I think as, as for all of us listening here who are BIPOC, it's important for us to remind ourselves just because we've lived our experience, it doesn't mean we've ever experienced. There's a mm -hmm. plurality. My brother is darker skin than me. He would, and you and I, you know, we both know what light, light skin privilege means. And that gives us something different than other people in our families or our friends because of the biases that exist and right. within our own cultures, even within our own cultures. And so I, uh, uh, I have to always remind myself that um, I don't know it all. And like, I'll talk to my parents sometimes and my parents had, you know, very different experiences coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were things where like, my parents don't care about who being white, voiced by a white guy in a Simpsons. For them, they don't, they're like, there was a brown character on TV. It was kind of funny. Sure. Yeah. Apuna has to be in that one. Like, they're like, this is so caricature. Like, we don't care. There's a, generation has come up, often mine, younger people are like, how dare you? Both are right. true, both are valid. And yes. what we have to learn too is not to eat our own. Is like, you can accept that my parents feel that way. I, I've, I, and you can say, okay, why do you feel that way? Educate me. And then I don't have to agree with them. I need to understand it because I don't want to, when I'm crusading for what I believe is important, I don't want to inadvertently lose those allies too. Sometimes mm -hmm. we take things to such extremes and in our rhetoric and our behavior that we can end up turning away allies. And sure, maybe you can take the position of maybe they weren't allies to begin with. Okay, but like, this is a numbers game. Like this is, this is what this is. We are going to win by progress with the most amount of people pushing to that boulder up the hill. Yep. So we need hands right now. I mean, if they're, even if they're performative and they're just there to cheer us on, guess what? They're not pushing it back down on us and that's progress. Yep. Yeah, that, that brings me to like one of the other points I wanted to ask you about was just um, how do we make sure we're not talking in our own bubble or echo chamber, right? Because one of the things that you mentioned is that um, uh, like kind of the idea of the corporate ceiling for Asians, right? Like, and the, the, the funny thing is I noticed is that like a couple of, uh, what was it, two weeks ago when the Oscars nominations came out, the Hollywood Reporter had a headline saying that the Asians have finally broke through the bamboo ceiling. Yes, yes. And then all these people on Twitter got mad because they're like, how dare you call it the bamboo ceiling? Yeah. And then, and then like, I think as Asians, I think we've grown up with that. <laughs> and, it, and it was, if I recall, an Asian American creator. And she's a writer. She was she a writer, yeah, the, the Asian American yeah. writer. And she, even, she And so that's yeah. the thing. Like, sometimes I, I'm thinking of this, like, you know, in, 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 in talking about these perspectives. Like how do we, how do I make sure that I'm not talking in a bubble? That we are making sure that we are, you know, uh, talking to everyone. Yeah, right? I, I'll say the or answer is attracting not, an audience that's you know, everyone. Yeah, I, I think I think you know what it is. Let's say get off social media though. I think it's useful. Is <laughs> you are not going to be harmed waiting five minutes to say something. Right. And by the way, there's a difference between saying. Stop Asian hate and Black Lives Matter, which to me are absolutely uh, inarguable positions. And I, that is just where I am. So I'm intractable. And I know some people say, well, Black Lives Matter is a political movement. I, look, 
I'm just not going to have a conversation, so don't, don't have it with me. <laughs> right. But it's, um, uh, I will say, I think we have to take a few minutes and ask ourselves, do we have the information that we need to render a judgment? And secondly, why do we need to render a judgment? Mm -hmm. and, and I think like that is, um, that's, uh, uh, those are the questions we have to ask ourselves because we don't know as much as we think we do. We may know more, but we also may not have the words we need to, to articulate it. And it is what I'll do is I'll Google hashtags. Like when I see a trend, if I don't understand it, I'll, I'll text one of my friends and be like, what is happening here? Right. Can you keep pointing some articles? Like there's a, um, and, and I think that's uh, that is the important thing, which is we have to ask like what's going on before we internet mob things and people. I'm not I, like this is not me complaining about cancel culture. I don't think cancel culture exists because Louis C.K. has a career again, so it doesn't really work um, yeah. anyway. Even if we wanted it to, my question is like, um, do are we speaking with nuance? Are we speaking precisely? And there's a thing for me. So I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a big person. I'm a big advocate for normalizing talking about various health issues. So uh, I've had a really best sleep. I've been happy for 25 years. I haven't slept yeah. a proper night's sleep in 25 years. I, Jason, I got up at 1.30 this morning. I haven't gotten back to sleep. I, I, I wake up anywhere between 20 to 40 times an hour. Scientifically oh, wow. proven sleep test. I've had, you know, it's, it's just what it is. And, I, and it's, there's a whole lot that comes with it. But what it is, is I get to be up all the time. And what I've learned is when I'm really tired, um, there is a way that like voices echo in my head. And when I get angry and fix it, and, like, and what I've had to learn to do is when I hear the voices in my head, the way everyone has different indicators, you might get sweaty, you might just get agitated, you might talk differently. When you realize you are being, um, I don't want to say emotional because that becomes coded, especially against women. There's nothing wrong mm -hmm. with being emotional. There ain't nothing wrong with it. Um, but when you, when you feel yourself being overcome by emotion and perhaps mm -hmm. the emotion is, is disproportionate to the intellectual part of your action, behavior, decision-making process, I have learned to take a step back and say, okay, my head is spinning. I can hear the voice. I can hear the like noises echoing. Let me just like, let me just take a breath and uh, you're going to sound dumb. You would actually help me with some to like go eat a spoon of peanut butter when it comes mm -hmm. down or it's a piece of chocolate and like yeah. I'll get up and come back to the computer and you can do that. And that's a great part of this work from home, right? You don't, no one, no one's looking at you funny for putting a spoon in a jar of peanut butter at your desk. Um, and I'll just like sit up and we have cats. So I'll play with the cat for a second, come back and be like, you know what? This wasn't so bad. I think all my email has to say my email, like think of it as my email can say as, as I previously said to you in this email, I'm too, you know, or I can just be like, hey, um, here's what we're doing. Here's a document for reference. Happy to talk through it you know, if you have questions. And what did I just do? I just moved the conversation forward. Yep. Now, I can move by tearing the person down, but what did I achieve? And I think when we have these conversations online and, and about race and identity, we need to just educate ourselves and say, instead of being, wow, this person's awful, like, take a step back and say, what, who, what, where, when, how, why? And do I have information? And is it possible I'm misunderstanding this in some way? And it may be possible or very unlikely. And then by the time you've done that, you can say, what am I adding to the discourse? Whether it be interpersonal or whatever, like, what am I adding? Mm -hmm. And I just think, I think the other part of it is, is Jason, having a diverse group of friends. So I yep. talk to, I have text chains with Asian American friends, with white friends, and they're mixed. And it's like, um, it'll be really interesting just talking about a subject as anodyne as Taylor Swift. And getting like feedback, and yeah. um, and like I was talking, I was talking. I had a, it was an Asian American friend and a, and a white friend, white American friend. We were talking about Taylor Swift and how she's now more politically conscious and uh, and vocal. And so, and one of the people on the chain on the chain was saying, "Yeah, there goes Taylor. You know, she's got she's got to find make find a way to make money off us somehow." Um, and I said, "I said, look, or." She wasn't a great ally in the past. She's being one now, and at least she's saying the words. And we should hold her to account. I just can't get mad at her for saying the words because she wasn't saying the right. words. I'd be mad at her for not saying it. Like I'm moving the goalposts on her. 
And I think that's, um, I think that is uh, really critical um, uh, is that we have this variety of people we talk to in our lives with different identities so that, and, and celebrities or whatever, we'll ca- if you don't have non-binary friend, cool. Like you may not realize you do, you do but <laughs> find some non-binary celebrities right. or trans celebrities. I know those are different things, but like find some to um, like Elliot Page, follow Elliot, follow him yeah. and, and learn a bit more about the trans experience and the trans life and the issues that matter to trans people. Follow someone non-binary. I'm going I'm to shout out some of their name is Danny Moore. They're a comics writer. They're amazing. Find out what it means to be a POC, you know, non-binary comics writer and what their lives are like and what matters to them. Like follow, follow some of these people and let their social media feeds educate you without yeah. make, like, you're not going to them and saying to someone like, hey, explain to me how this works because that's putting a burden on them. Yeah. But you're, you're, you're making sure that you're consuming their voices and opinions and then keep diversifying. And if they're not, you can't get these people on your day-to-day the real Zoom life. On social media use social media for that yep and exactly and you know like that's the only way um i think it's the only way we have to educate ourselves sorry I, you're, you're getting super long answers for me on everything <laughs> no it's all really i think helpful because it's specific uh there is both your perspective but also something that people can take away um, one last question is, mm-hmm. do you have any either, it could be current or old, um, any film, TV, podcast, comic suggestions or recommendations? Yes. Um, so my, my birthday, uh, last year, it's October 10th, which is traditionally around Canadian Thanksgiving. Um, mm-hmm. Sean and I went out, we went out, um, had to do a return at a store and then had to go grocery shopping. I was racially profiled at the store. It was an Under Armour store uh, here in uh, LA, and it um, won't be going back there. It was very clear. And then my wife at a Ralph's was the grocery store, if you're not in LA, was followed around by security guard in a way that was uh, inappropriate. And I remember we came home and I said, fuck, this birthday it sucks. I was like, oh, Michelle, there's a show you and I should watch together. The first five minutes is so, so therapeutic. It's worrying. That the Cinemax show is now on HBO Max. Yeah. If you haven't watched it, yep. two seasons. I yep. want to warn everyone: there's an episode in the second season, the second episode nine, that will make you sick to your stomach with Asian violence. I know you know what I'm talking about, but you have to watch it because it's the honesty of the show. But in the first five minutes of the first episode, there is one of those cool moments where the kid, where um, a- or a- Andrew Koji gets to be the badass Asian guy. Oh, yeah. makes me so happy! And he basically it's it's. He gets, he gets to kick racism in the face, and it's amazing. Yep. And yep. and it's um, and you know what I mean. And we watched that show, and we devoured the season, and it is the exact show we needed. Um, and I love that show. Um, I so I want to recommend that uh, for podcasts. Um, I uh, want to recommend. Uh, what do I want to recommend? The Steve Dangle podcast. If you're a hockey fan, uh, it is a great <laughs> Canadian podcast by three awesome folks. Um, if I was waiting for that bit of Canadian. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I have something Canadian in there. I was debating, debating. And then um, if it is uh, if it is comic books you are looking for, um, oh, man, I would say uh, there is no deficit of amazing comics, but uh, there is uh, there are a lot of really good comics at Skybound. So I'm going to recommend Skybound Comics. Uh, an image. There's a comic called Infidel from Image that is a okay. racial horror uh, that is really cool. And the author um, uh, has a new book coming out called The Good Asian, which is a uh, hmm. noir, noir thing from Image Comics, who's our publishing partner. Uh, yeah. From Skybound, I recommend to track down a comic called Excellence. Uh, essentially, it's Black Harry Potter with a social voice. And I will tell you that in, at oh. issue seven, Donald Trump shows up as a leader, uh, as oh. a member of an evil white cabal. So it does right. not lack controversy, but wow. it's um, it's Harry it's Harry Potter with, with by Kendrick the vibes of Kendrick Lamar, and it's just it's oh, such a that. great comic. And um, those are those are ones that ch- I tell you to to, to check out. Um, and books, um, there is a book that I cannot now. I think it's called Nothing General About It. It's written by Maurice Bernard, who's one of the main actors in General Hospital. He talks a lot about his own bipolar disorder. 
mental health and uh, his career in daytime soaps. I think daytime soaps have always been on the, um, if not always been on the edge of uh, Asian American representation, they deal with a lot of issues for other media. I'm a, I'm a real big General Hospital fan. So wow. That's what I got for you. I love that. All right. Well, thank you so much. I want to acknowledge you for all this wisdom, all this cool stories um, and what you're doing. I'm so excited that you're at Skybound. Um, and I can't wait for us to be able to meet in person. Again. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Definitely some dinners to have. You and I are going to choose, uh, I think, the best spirit of this, let's choose a good uh, minority-owned restaurant next time we have let's dinner. Do it. Let's do have some dinner and have drinks. Have a good time. Get a, get some friends together and enjoy. Definitely. All right. I'm All going right. to end this now.